Okay, 210, let's get rolling. Uh, welcome to Deep Unsupervised Learning, first lecture. Let's start with the instructor team. I'm Peter Beal, I'm a professor teaching the course, and we have three co-instructors with me here. Uh, maybe three of you can briefly stand up, maybe even here in front of the camera also, and do a quick self-intro. Um, yeah, Philip, why don't you go sure, first, go then start. Kevin, then Wilson. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Philip. I'm a PhD student uh, with Professor Peter Beal, um, and I work on a variety of different topics, but largely with real-world robot learning, um, crossing reinforcement learning, imitation learning, unsupervised learning. So yeah, hope we'll have a great semester. Thanks, Philip. Yeah, hey everyone. I'm Kevin, also a PhD student with uh, Peter and Sergey. And um, yeah, I work kind of on reinforcement learning algorithms and generative modeling, which we'll talk about in the class. Great, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, hey everyone. I'm also one of Peter's PhD students, and I do research in generative models, more specifically stuff with like video and language generation. And you actually took the class as an undergrad here at Berkeley. Uh, yeah, I took the class, and I was a TA the semester after. Yeah. So it's, it's, been, cool. it's been a long time since it's been then. A while. So last time we taught the class was uh, 2020, so four years ago. It's pretty interesting because I was looking at the slides from four years ago, and I saw I put a lot of motivation in there, and especially five years ago, a lot of motivation why people should study deep unsupervised learning. Because I thought people weren't interested enough in deep unsupervised learning. It should really motivate them. And now I feel like I need to do the opposite. Uh, <laughs> or maybe slightly more precisely, um, I want to make sure in this lecture to make clear what we are actually planning to do in this class because it's becoming so popular that in principle you could do a million different things in a deep unsupervised learning class. And so I want to make sure you know what we are going to do here rather than maybe what you imagine we could be doing. So a couple of logistics. Communication, uh, there's a website, that's the URL. Um, went up, I think, yesterday. Um, we should be putting all information up there that's needed for the class. We'll put uh, typically the slides there before lecture, not today, it's the first lecture. It's always a bit of a transition period when the semester starts. But go, starting next week, we plan to put up the slides before lecture. Uh, so you can take notes on them if you want or look at them a little bit ahead of time. Um, has the schedule, everything. If you see anything that seems off, let us know. Um, could be that there's still a little typo here or there, uh, just let us know. Some announcements. Uh, we use Ed for communication. I've actually never used it. Um, it's the first time I'm going to be using it, but it seems the, the standard thing to use for Berkeley classes currently, so I'm excited to, to be using it. Um, please start there if you have questions, because then others can see your questions, help answer them, instead of us getting separate questions from everybody, who might, then the questions might have a lot of overlap. If you're, by the way, registered or on the wait list, we already put you into the forum for this class. If you are neither, then you have to put yourself in. So Ed is preferred if you have questions for us. Um, uh, just to be clear, not during lecture. I mean, like, during lecture, just raise your hand, ask questions that way. But outside of lecture, start there if you have, rather than email. But if it's something you think that's more suitable for email, feel free to email the staff list. Or if you think it's specific to any one of us, email just us individually. Um, but try to use Ed if possible. Office hours will start next week. Um, for me, it'll be after lecture. So lecture is 2 to 5 on Thursdays. Um, it's a long slot, 3 hours. Most lectures are not that long. We'll take a pretty big break in the middle, 15, 20-minute break. Um, We'll even have snacks to uh, have like reinforcements for the second half of, of lecture. Um, and that's actually quite deliberate. I think one of the big things you can get out of the class is to get to know other students in the class who are working on similar topics. You can exchange ideas, come up with new ideas together. And I think having the long lecture slot with a break in the middle where you get to hang out, talk to each other, can be very good for that purpose. I'll do my office hours right after class, so that'll be a very long stretch if you stick around for that. Uh, it'll be five to six. Um, Wilson, Kevin, and uh, Philip will uh, announce their office hours sometime next week. Um, we still figure out how to do it. We might have some office hours, or maybe one TA is in charge of 
one homework and then has all the office hours leading up to that homework due time, or maybe we'll have regular like weekly office hours, we're still sorting that out. So for homework, by the way, TA office hours are the best venue, even though I'd love to be able to help you with homework. Like I dream every, every, every winter break, I dream of a semester where I actually have the time to work through the homework myself and uh, then be able to help you. The reality is like, I just can't, like I don't know the details well enough, but these three will. So for homework specific questions, go to them. Um, for anything else, all of us uh, should be able to help you. Um, and I think for a lot of us, one of the favorite things is to talk with you about your projects, what you are doing research on, how you think it might connect with things in the course, and how things in the course can help you be more effective in whatever you are doing research-wise. Or maybe your research is squarely in unsupervised learning and is directly feeding off the course. Um, admission to the course, it's a bit of a challenge that there is more demand than there is uh, spots, and I think that's just going to be the reality. Some people are not going to get in. Um, what we'll do to nudge things towards uh, a best possible situation is people who don't have a strong homework one or no homework one at all submitted will ask uh, the registrar's office to drop them out of the class. Now obviously if something really crazy comes up and you can't do homework one because there's some external circumstances that reach out to us and let us know and we can think about it. But to us that's just a sign if you're either not suitable for the class or you just don't care enough about the class to submit a strong homework, we'll drop you and we'll let people in from the wait list. Also, if just after today, if you re register for the class and realize, oh my God, I thought it was gonna be what all these VCs talk about with generative AI, we're gonna be like the next big startup out of this class. It's not exactly targeted that way. Um, so then maybe also drop out of the class, make room for others. Could be many reasons you think the class is not for you after today's lecture. Don't wait till the drop deadline because that's inconvenient for, for everybody else. Just drop when you know you're going to drop. Even if you don't make it into class, you're welcome to audit. You're welcome to submit homework. Uh, that, that's all good. You just won't get the credit for having taken the class. Um, and as we move people into the class, um, it could be undergrads, could be good fits for the class, PhD students. I mean, it's really more about what you know, what you're capable of, than exactly what degree you're pursuing. Typically, PhD students will be more natural fits, but not always, so we'll see what happens. Any questions about registration? Yes? Are there any like, quantifiable like, cutoffs for what a strong homework one means, and also how does this relate to whether you're like fully registered versus waitlisted versus so we'll grade everybody's submission, whether you're waitlisted or not even waitlisted, or you are registered. If you submit your homework, we'll grade it. Um, then what a strong homework one is, the way we design them is essentially they should be solvable for somebody who can, who's taking the class. It's not something where like a strong homework is like solving half the homework. A strong homework means that you essentially solve everything. That doesn't mean it can be a beauty mistake here or there, but it can be that there's just a whole part of the homework that you didn't do. Um, we're also here to help you. We're, I mean, we want you to learn. It's not that you need to be able to do this without any help. Come to office hour and ask questions. But if you use all the resources available and all the time you're willing to commit to it and then end up having big parts of your homework or even just in one substantial section that's just blank or completely off, then likely we would drop you if we see that there are many people on the wait list who have much stronger uh, submissions. Um, think of it like, you know, maybe in, in numbers, Let's say you got to score 90% or something on homework one, but don't worry if you have 98 or 99. We're not going to rank people and then like be like, okay, pick the exact ranking, but roughly 90% as a threshold, you're good. Yes? What should we expect as the deadline for homework one? Uh, coming up in a moment. Great question. Yeah, I have a slide on, the, on all the deadlines. Okay. Um, let me tell you a bit about the syllabus. Today's intro, we're not going to cover actual uh, materials today. We're going to cover motivation for the class, why this class might be worth taking. Um, and we will cover some logistics. Um, but then next week, we'll start diving in with autoregressive models, which is the first type of model we'll cover. The week after, we'll do flow models. Then we'll do latent variable models. Then we'll do GANs uh, slash implicit models. And then we'll do diffusion models and final project discussion. So 
those will be, in some sense, the five main types of models that we'll cover. Um, from there, we'll look at other types of learning. Uh, so the five main generative models. Then we'll look at self-supervised learning, non-generative representation learning. We'll look at strength and weaknesses of everything covered so far because part of what's hard about the field, I would say, is that it's a bit disjoint. It's not so easy to directly necessarily compare a VAE with an autoaggressive model. There are pros and cons to them. The field hasn't fully converged. Maybe we'll never converge on just one thing. Clearly, language is more converged onto autoaggressive, and vision is more converged onto um, diffusion models right now, but this, this can change over time. Uh, in fact, last time we taught the course, diffusion models didn't exist. Um, we still have to invent them uh, later that semester. Semi-supervised learning, unsupervised distribution alignment, these are things that are somehow not as hot topics these days, but I think they're very important. And I think part of what the beauties of this class, by the way, is the same thing for flow models, is that we have the time to cover some things that are less hot today, but maybe with some innovation can become the next breakthrough if you find the right innovation. Compression. Compression is not typically a machine learning topic, but it turns out everything unsupervised learning is effectively tied back to compression. Because the core hypothesis in unsupervised learning is that you're modeling data. And what does it mean to model data? Well, what does it mean to do compression is the same thing. It's finding the patterns in the data and based on that, representing it in a more compact way. In machine learning, we don't just care about compact. We want it to be semantically meaningful. So there's a little bit of an extra twist to the notion of compression there, but it's very, very related. Spring break week, no lecture, uh, naturally. Then we'll do language models, a dedicated lecture. Obviously, some things will come back there from earlier. Uh, language models are autoaggressive models, largely. So some things will come back, but we'll dive much deeper into specifics of language models. Then we'll have a midterm. Um, I think I have a separate slide on that, so I'll wait for that to say more about that. Um, we'll do multimodal models and video generation. That lecture, and I'll definitely remind you, will be in a different location. We'll be in the auditorium upstairs, slightly bigger room. Um, then we'll have Electron AI for science, uh, and we'll have representation learning for reinforcement learning. Note that these two lectures are in the same week. So there's going to be a Thursday and a Friday lecture. It's going to be a pretty wild week because you have like three hours on Thursday, another three hours on Friday. Um, but we won't have a lecture the next week. So the last week of the normal semester, the one be a lecture, I moved it forward onto the Friday before that. Um, week 15, no lecture RR week. Then week 16, your final project reports will be due and video presentation submission. So we'll take, instead of doing an in-class sequence of presentations, which I found at the end of the semester, students are so busy and it's hard to find a time to attend the other students' presentations. So it's often like students just jumping in, doing their presentation, jumping back out, get to study for their final or another project. We're just gonna take submissions. We'll watch the videos, but we're gonna share the videos. Unless there's a specific reason you don't want your videos shared, we'll share them internally with the class. So anybody who's interested in a topic can go watch the video presentation on that topic that was done in the class. Any questions on the schedule? Yeah. Is lecture 13 be in the same classroom at the same time as usual? I don't know yet. I've put in a request for a, for a room, but I haven't heard back yet. Um, yeah, very good question and good reminder, but it is on my to-do list to, to sort it out. I asked them two days ago, and it's probably a busy beginning of semester um, for them to respond. Another thing about lectures, they're all recorded. So there's a Camtasia recording running here, which sees whoever is standing in front of the laptop and records the screen. Can't guarantee it works out every time. Sometimes these things crash, and then there's no proper recording, but hopefully, usually it works out, and then we'll put these online. Yeah? So you, you do have a lecture uh, on the same day as the midterm? Yeah, so the midterm will be very short. I'll say more about that soon. Homework, we'll have homework one go out next week, Thursday, due 13 days later. Then 14 days after that, um, homework two will go out. So essentially every two weeks, a homework will go out. If you look at the previous offering, what you see has changed that there is right now no homework on flow models. If you care about them, you want to learn more about them and do a homework on them, you can go to the 
2020 website, do the homework from there for your own good, not, not for the class. Um, I think it's still interesting, but we only want to give you four homeworks, and we think right now it's better to give you a homework on diffusion models rather than flow models, just the way things are shaping up. But again, these things can change. You could come back here a year from now and say, what a big mistake. You should really have uh, done flow models. They're way more important, um, hard to predict. But this is what we're going to do. So that puts us roughly halfway to semester. And then the idea is that from there, a lot of your time outside of class is spent on your final project. For homework, you can discuss things, uh, but you need to write your own code and make your own submission. Um, you can be late. There's a late policy, but not too much, at most four days. Um, why do we have the policy of at most four days? Logistically, essentially, we want to be able to get started on grading is one. Two, we think you can learn a lot from looking at solutions, but you learn more if not a lot of time has passed before you get to see the solutions. So after four days, we will release solutions. You can look at those, learn from that, and hopefully that's a good learning experience. But at the same time, you know, that means you can't submit after those four days. Again, if there are really exceptional circumstances, always you know, don't be afraid to reach out. We can think about it. Um, but uh, that's the standard model we're going to use. So the midterm. We have a midterm during lecture, the beginning of lecture on April 11th. Um, I think in the end, what's most important is what you learn from, from the class, what you take away, and what hopefully you put in your final project along the way. But the reason I like to do a midterm is because it gives you an opportunity to be forced to really study the materials. Um, you're all so busy. And if nobody forces you to study the materials, probably you just have something else fighting for your time and winning out. Um, it's not meant to be excruciating or to be weeding you out in any way or other. Um, it's going to be topics covered to the week before. We will provide a document with questions and answers. So essentially, we will go through the lecture slides, pick the most important derivations according to us, write a question, let's say derive the rational lower bound for a VAE, and then put the answer below it, and you'll have anywhere 10 to 20 pages of that kind of material. And then when the midterm comes, we'll ask you two or three of those. Um, obviously, if you fail to study two or three of them, you might do pretty poorly. But hopefully, since only 10 to 20 pages you have to study, it should be easy to just study everything. Uh, and it's upon us to make sure that these are the 10 to 20 most important things from the class. You can, in principle, memorize it. Uh, I don't think that's the best way to study it. Ideally, you understand it, and that way are able to rederive it. But you know, nobody is stopping you from, from memorizing it either. And often, memorizing can help you understand. Uh, it's kind of an interleave process. In fact, language models just kind of you know, memorize and then understand. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's just what you're supposed to do, I guess. OK, any questions about the midterm? All right. Um, Final project, uh, scope. Ideally, you explore and push the boundaries in unsupervised learning. Uh, there will be a proposal. It could be a proposal plus evaluation of new algorithms, architectures, investiga investigation and application of unsupervised learning, benchmarking unsupervised learning. It could be something related to compression, studying synergies between unsupervised learning and other types of learning, and so forth. Um, pretty broad what's acceptable but it really has to involve the topics in the class. Ideally, it could be the foundation for a future conference paper. There's no expectation that by the time you submit the final project report that it's already at the level of a conference paper. But hopefully, maybe there's like the initial experiments that show the promise that this could really become a conference paper with an extra push that you put behind it. Um, we actually encourage you to come up with your own idea. If you can, it'll likely be more original because you have your own background, your own knowledge that's different from ours. Um, that said, um, we're also happy to brainstorm ideas together. Um, and often going back and forth can also lead to new things that neither one of us would come up with uh, individually. So the main reason I started teaching this class five years ago was for these projects, I wanted more unsupervised learning projects to happen at Berkeley. Um, some really good ones have happened. Um, one that um, 
Uh, sticks with me uh, is Roshan Rao, uh, student in the first offering of the class, did a project on sequence modeling for biology, uh, wrote one of the first papers on essentially protein property prediction based on pre-training on just sequence modeling, um, released a tape benchmark as a NURBS paper for that. This is all before, before AlphaFold. Um, and from there, I actually went to the Facebook slash meta um, bio uh, AI group. And since then, that team has left meta and has started a company that's essentially trying to build the foundation models for bio for, for the future. So that would be a great trajectory. Any one of you go on that trajectory, love it. I mean, there's many other great trajectories, but something that, that is really, um, try to do something exciting. Um, if something doesn't work, but you have a lot of um, evidence that you tried things that are meaningful and didn't work, that's more interesting to me at least than if you did something pretty boring and yeah, it worked, but it was kind of boring and it was kind of, you know, kind of too close to what other people have done. So try, try to pick something exciting and surprising if it works out. Timeline, project proposals due February 28th, so you have a bit of time. Um, you'll put that in a Google Doc so we can easily give you feedback. About a week later, um, we will have iterated with you in that Google Doc and hopefully have arrived at a project proposal that we're all happy with. Um, then a three-page milestone is due in April. We'll also do a Google Doc for ease of feedback. Um, the idea here is that it forces you to get started. It's very easy to wait till the end of the semester if there's nothing forcing you to get started earlier. So you'll have to start about a month and a half before the end of the semester or even a bit earlier to get something in there. It doesn't need to be anywhere near final, um, but you should have some results, some initial investigations that you can report on. May 10th, everything will be due, I believe. I'd have to check, but I think that is the, the Friday of finals week. Um, <coughs> Grading logistics, 60% homework, 10% midterm, 30% final project. Um, that's, yeah. And then the, the letter grades, there's something on the website that says what the letter grade is based on the grades that you get. Um, but I believe it's probably like 90% and above is an A. And then from there, every 5%, it loses uh, a partial letter grade. You need to attend class, um, no hard requirement. Um, Obviously, there's not enough seats, so it could be even be un uncomfortable to sit on the, on the floor for three hours. Um, but it, I would say it's highly recommended. Um, and it goes back to the opportunity to learn from each other. As I said in the beginning of lecture, we'll have pretty large break right in the middle. Good opportunity to learn from each other. And often new projects arise from that. Uh, actually, Roshan's project that I mentioned he got to know some of the students that he did that with in the class. They were bio students taking the, the class. He was a CS student, and then they start working on it together. Only the third offering of the course, so some rough edges along the way. Bear with us, give feedback. If there's something you think that might be better done a different way, let us know. That doesn't mean we can always get around doing it, but we'll take notes, and what we can do, we will do. Okay, so that's logistics. Any questions about logistics before we start with Marcana? In the back. Um, yeah, you probably already mentioned this, but if a student can't make it to lecture on a given year, like on a given week, is there any time off for the lecture? Yeah, so we're trying to record. Camtasia is running right now, which is a screen capturing software, uh, which can capture at higher resolution for the screen than, let's say, Zoom would. Um, We'll try every time. Maybe sometimes it crashes and it doesn't work, but hopefully every time we have a recording, yes. And then we'll hopefully post it uh, later that evening. Or a couple more questions. Yes. Are the final projects completely independent? Or oh, good question. Up to three people. I would recommend forming teams of two or three, because often when there is more than one of you, you have more of a back and forth on ideas, and you can arrive at more interesting things. Uh, we do expect a little bit of a linear scaling, so if there's two or three of you, you're supposed to have a more substantial achievement in your project than when there's only one of you. Yes? Um, uh, actually, it's a follow-up question about where can I find the lecture notes and where can I find and submit the homework? Yeah, so we will um, link the website uh, from 
the forum, the ad forum later today. So then you can find the website where all the materials will be posted. For submitting homework, um, I guess we'll sort that out when we release the first homework. So by the time it comes out next week, we'll hopefully have uh, set up the way to receive your homework also. Yes? Um, just turn in the first homework and we'll take things from there. All right, so let's switch from logistics to content. What is deep unsupervised learning? It's about capturing rich patterns in raw data with deep networks in a label-free way. The label-free part really matters. It's the original motivation for unsupervised learning because labeling is time-consuming. And hence, it's nice if you don't have to do it. Um, but there's actually additional motivations beyond it being label-free, which we'll get to soon. There's kind of two sub-areas in unsupervised learning. There is generative models, which try to recreate the raw data distribution. And there is self-supervised learning, which tend to be puzzle tasks. You have your data, and you remove some part of the data or some view of the data in some way or other, and then it's supposed to fill it back in. If you can fill that back in, then presumably you understand something about the data. Um, generative models recreate the raw data distribution. There's a lot of talk about generative AI. And I was thinking, like, how, how would I really define what we're trying to cover in this course for the generative AI part? And the way I think of it is, it's still neural nets, right? It's, it's still a neural net. You, you're outputting, you have an input, you generate an output. Even a generative model is a neural network and it looks a lot like supervised learning in many cases. So what, what's really different about it? Um, the way I think of it as being different is that in a lot of the typical work in supervised learning, there's a very clear deterministic solution and that you have an image and there's a clear label that needs to be assigned to it, cat or dog, or you have a self-driving car scene and every pixel needs to be street pavement versus pedestrian and so forth. And so the output is in some sense deterministic what you're supposed to do. Whereas in generative models, we're trying to model pretty complex output distributions on the neural network. And that's actually hard to do, to model complicated distributions and that's why there's actually five different lectures, each three-hour lectures covering five different ways of covering effectively complex distributions with neural networks. And so that's the way I would think about it is generative models, at least in this class, is about models that can represent complicated probability distributions well beyond the kind of everything's concentrated on one output. Self-supervised learning is the puzzle tasks. Um, the, there's been an interesting back and forth. Initially, unsupervised learning, generative models were what people were excited about. Then it became all self-supervised learning for a while, and now it's swinging back to more generative models. Who knows where it'll be next year? Um, I think it's good to know both of them. So why do we care? I think this might be the most interesting motivation of them all. I hope you all know Jeff Hinton. If you don't, please uh, know him now. Jeff Hinton is essentially the godfather of deep learning. He's been working on deep learning since the 1970s. Had to wait for it to have a breakthrough till 2012. So it was like a 40 year career of working on the thing that he thought was gonna be right. And after 40 years, he proved himself right because he was the one with his students who had the big breakthrough on image recognition with AlexNet. Now this is motivation for unsupervised learning. The brain has about 10 to the power of 14 synapses. Synapses in the brain are connections between neurons. And they're essentially the learnable part of the brain. Whether neurons are connected or not is the variation in what our brain is as a little baby where nothing is really wired up to know anything. And then when we're older, we start knowing things. 10 to the 14 synapses. And we only live for about 10 to the nine seconds. So we have a lot more parameters than data. This motivates the idea that we must do a lot of unsupervised learning since the perceptual input, including proprioception, is the only place we can get 10 to the five dimensions of constraint per second, right? Because if we assume that the brain is kind of meant to be fully utilized, um, 
then we do need to get 10 to the 5, essentially, bits in some sense per, per second to fully utilize our brain. Now, there are other motivations to get why the brain is so large. It could be that a larger brain can learn faster than a smaller brain, even if not that many bits have to be learned. That's something Jeff has also talked about. I think both probably have some truth to it. But this is a very clear sign that supervised learning is not enough for how humans essentially use their brains. There's a lot more going on beyond supervised learning. Jan LeCun, similar thing, need tremendous amount of information to build machines that have common sense and generalize. Um, and I think this kind of gets into another trend that we've seen recently in AI, which is foundation models. Foundation models are trained on such a large amount of data that they generalize much better than any models before. Um, it used to be you'd have a model for, let's say, um, recognizing the sentiment of uh, a paragraph. Is this a positive or a negative review of a product? And you had a dedicated language model to do that. And it was better back then to train a dedicated language model for sentiment analysis than to train one model to do everything. But that's changed. Foundation models are trained on all the data, outperform the specialized models now. And I would argue, in some sense, that that's the closest we're getting to common sense with current machines, is by training on such a wide swath of data that somehow everything starts to fall within distribution, at least a little bit. So Jan LeCun um, presented this cake, now known as Le Cake, um, at, the, at his NeurIPS keynote in 2016. And the point he was making is that um, back in 2016, actually, all the excitement at NeurIPS was about reinforcement learning. So he was trying to make a point uh, that people maybe should be a little less excited about reinforcement learning was part of his point. Not, not excited, but maybe a little less, and pay more attention to unsupervised learning. His point was that essentially, you need a lot of data. Only way to get a lot, lot of data is unsupervised learning. So that's the foundation of the cake. It's most of the volume slash mass of the cake. The icing is the supervised learning. And then the cherry is the reinforcement learning. It's pretty interesting. If you look at the um, ChatGPT, it's exactly this model. ChatGPT is trained on the entire internet to get the foundational knowledge. Supervised fine tuning, that's the icing on the cake. And then RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback, that's the cherry. It's the cake essentially predicted um, six years ahead of time how AI would shape up into its at least current most capable form. Another way you might get motivated for unsupervised learning is this notion of ideal intelligence. So ideal intelligence, people argue, is all about compression, finding all the patterns in your data. That's what it means to be smart. You understand all the patterns that are there. So finding all patterns means finding a short description of raw data, meaning low comma of complexity. So what is comma of complexity? Comma of complexity says the size in some sense measured as comma of complexity of a certain data set is the size of the shortest computer program that can represent that data set. Put it out, that's only its output. Uh, the simplest way to do it, but that might not be the winning uh, size, is to just store the entire data set and just have a program that says print, and then it prints out the entire data set. So that's, that's a very simple program, but it's rarely going to be the one that wins. But if you had a completely random string with no pattern in it, that might be the winning program that you could possibly produce um, to do that. But for many real-world data sets, um, there's other ways to describe the data that's more efficient, and Komarov complexity measures that. By the way, the way to think of this in neural net land is that you should think of the size of the neural net as essentially the size of your program. The neural network is the program, because instead of writing code, you're training a neural network. So the neural network is the program, and so you're sometimes asking, what is the most compact neural network that can regenerate my data? And that should be the one that understands the data the best, and hence, uh, best at, let's say, generalizing, hopefully. There are some subtleties there, by the way. Smallest neural net doesn't need to mean smallest number of parameters. It could mean something else. It could mean that you have low precision parameters, but large number of parameters. And maybe that's a better way to represent things 
than having higher precision parameters but less parameters. Um, so keep that in mind. Shortest code length, um, sh in principle, should also allow for optimal inference. Um, and Solma of induction is kind of a bit more focused on, on that, that side of things. Um, extensible to optimal action-making agents, which is called AIXI. So AIXI is essentially looking at this notion that if I want to build an agent that solves problems, what is the smallest agent I can build that can solve these problems? And that's the counterpart of recreating your data in unsupervised learning, but now in reinforcement learning. Here's another motivation, very related. In fact, Ilya Siskiver, chief scientist of OpenAI, co-founder of OpenAI, um, talked about this just about a half year ago at the Simons Institute here. Assume we pre-train in an unsupervised way on data distribution D1, and then fine-tune on a data distribution D2, then if D1 and D2 are related, compressing D2 conditioned on already knowing D1 should be more efficient than compressing D2 outright. The additional effort should be less, given the effort you've done before to compress D1, if there's any kind of relationship between them. So pre-training on D1 should allow you to learn faster on D2. This is kind of like a very, let's say, it's not a super mathematically precise, but it's an intuitive argument for why unsupervised learning should help when you later, all you care about is supervised learning. All you care about is labeling every pixel on your self-driving car scene. Still, unsupervised learning might be the right thing to start with. By the way, these kinds of motivation, I remember um, early days, of, um, early days of, of OpenAI when it was just the 10 of us, um, Ilya, John, Andre, uh, a couple of my students, myself, Back then, supervised learning was always winning. Like anything you cared about, supervised learning was always winning. And we actually had to think hard about these aspects to decide that we should work on unsupervised learning. Part of motivation was there's more data, so clearly that, that's gonna help. But the other part was people would say, well, it doesn't matter because that data is not what you want. You just need to label enough supervised data and you'll get things done. But our argument was things like this is why we should still work on unsupervised learning. Today, that argument is more moot. It's empirical. You pre-train and then fine-tune, you get better results. Um, wasn't the case back then when you, went, you started with unsupervised as your pre-training. Aside from theoretical interests, um, deep unsupervised learning has many powerful applications. You can generate novel data. Uh, you can do conditional synthesis. You can do compression with it. Um, by the way, the compression hasn't really been commercialized yet. I'm still wondering when that might happen, because um, when, we'll, when we'll see in the electron compression, effectively, what is compression? How much can you compress a data set? It's based on how good a model you have for the probability distribution that constitutes your data set. And then the bound is the entropy of that distribution. That's how much you can compress your data. And so if you have a better model, you should be able to compress better. So far, it turns out that maybe these neural nets are kind of large, and so once you count up actually the Kolmogorov complexity, including the size of the neural net and the amount of inference required to decode, it hasn't been winning yet. You could imagine a future where if compute chips become even larger and cheaper, that you have a massive neural network decoding all the movies that you watch, and very little bits have to come over the pipe because it can decode efficiently and from a very highly compressed representation compared to what's possible today. Improve any downstream task by doing pre-training on or self-supervised. Production level impact, Google search, powered by BERT uh, was the first one. That's why I'm highlighting it here. I think that was the first real production level impact of unsupervised learning. Flexible building blocks for other things. Some of the architectures that were invented for unsupervised learning are now reused in reinforcement learning in supervised learning. So a lot of reasons um, you could be interested in what we're gonna cover here. So let me dive into, actually, let's see, how long are we in? Yeah, let's, let's, let's not take a break right now. Let's keep going just a little bit. Um, this is part of where generative models started, at least for image generation. 
Uh, it was called Deep Belief Nets back then. It was a different name, um, but it was the same kind of idea. You train a neural network, a specific type of neural network, in this case, that has fallen out of favor. And these were some of the early results showing that you can train these neural nets to generate images that look like the images in your training set. At the time, this was pretty surprising to people. It was still hard to correctly classify cats and dogs at the time, because that didn't really happen until ImageNet, AlexNet 2012. Because the fact that while people were still struggling to have an image classifier for cats and dogs, other people were generating digits, it was pretty surprising that was possible. Um, the variational autoencoder kind of made one of the big steps forward after neural networks broke through in 2012, and we'll look a lot at the VAE a couple lectures from now. Um, GANs by Ian Goodfellow and collaborators in 2014 were the first sign that actually these neural nets are likely to generate realistic images in the foreseeable future. Until GANs, somehow, if you look back at the VAE, everything looks kind of smoothed out. And that's just how these models tended to be. They tried to predict things that are on average kind of right, but on average being right is not exactly right. It's like if the answer is you know either yes or no to a question saying something in the middle is never going to be correct um, same thing here it's just smoothing things out too much but GAN started resolving that this still low resolution that was just compute limitation at the time exciting story here by the way um, Ian was uh, having drinks with friends in a bar in Montreal and they just you know what do you do when you're an AI student you have drinks you talk about AI um, and then they're just like, how is it possible that these neural nets can't create proper images? Even a neural net can see that these images aren't sharp. Um, and Ian's like, wait, even if a neural, if a neural net can even see this, these pre previous images are not that sharp, I should just use, use a neural net to give feedback to the create, creation neural net, the generative neural net, and set up a feedback loop and see what happens. He coded up the same night. He starts seeing a real sign of life, and then a little later wrote to paper. Interestingly, um, GANs, well, here's another interesting backstory. Actually, Alec Radford, first author of this paper, this was the first time with the bedroom data set here that GANs were showing actual high quality images. And people said, this is not just a sign that this will be possible soon, this is now becoming possible. Um, Alec, I believe, um, dropped out of college to play with AI and had some good success. He wrote this paper and then OpenAI recruited him. I remember that we recruited him. I was like, okay, he did the best generative model to date back in 2015. Um, and so um, it was interesting at the time that these things were possible. Um, just, you know, you find a paper in the archive and based on that you decide to recruit somebody. Alec, by the way, was a great recruit obviously because Alec Radford is the one who started the whole GPT um, uh, sequence of works at OpenAI. GPT-1, well, GPT-1 in some sense was, was an LSTM, but then GPT-2, 3, all started with Alec. Uh, interesting story there. Uh, he actually let, let a model train while he was away for a while, and then it kept improving. He realized, wait, we've never been training long enough. Clearly, we should be training much longer, and that also helped inspire the much uh, longer training sessions. Um, so sometimes uh, di going away and not killing your process is, is uh, the way to go, too. <laughs> From, these are some images of uh, faces, which we as humans tend to be very sensitive to artifacts in faces. So obviously here we're seeing signs of life, but we don't yet see this as realistic. Um, super resolution GANs came soon thereafter. Um, Alyosh Efros and his students here did things with GANs that were very entertaining. You could uh, essentially recolor uh, subjects and images. In this case, the horse uh, becomes a, a, a zebra. Um, and then DeepMind did a very large training, the first very, very large GAN training. And so this was the first time, by, this was 2018, um, where GANs were showing very realistic images. Now, some of them in between are not super realistic because it's interpolating between different ones. Um, but you can see when it's not interpolating, it is... Um, is it playing music? So pretty amazing. Um, at the time, people essentially thought this is it. You know, GANs are the way to generate images uh, in the best possible way. And um, a lot of 
iterations were done, especially Nvidia did a lot of work scaling up even more, getting even more um, impressive results over time. Um, style again came out of Nvidia. Uh, these faces become kind of indistinguishable from real human faces, and that was uh, also 2018. Then something happened that was kind of surprising in some sense. Uh, even though GANs were all the rage and everybody thought this is it, we, this is how we're going to solve image generation, um, diffusion models came on the scene. You might wonder why even bother coming up with diffusion models at the time. Um, the challenge people ran into with GANs was that even though everything was very realistic, it wasn't covering the entire distribution that the data had. So it was focusing on specific modes of the distribution rather than having great coverage of the entire distribution. And so the open question at the time is, can you come up with a new approach or improve GANs? That's fine too, but can you come up with something that is both generating realistic images and has good coverage, doesn't leave out a lot of the um, data effectively? And so diffusion models showed that you know, clear sign alive in this paper in 2020 and they're also the models powering almost all the image generation today. So I'll just put some fun examples, at least some of the ones that I find the most fun, um, all done with diffusion models. Um, these were not in the original diffusion paper. The ones I'll show here are from Dali from OpenAI. Um, a masterful oil painting, a Persian exotic cat discovering their astounding crypto losses while checking their phone. Why is this an interesting prompt? Well, it's interesting partially because it's entertaining obviously, but it's also interesting because it's targeting something that would not be in the training data, right? And if the AI, in this case, this diffusion model, can generate a good response to this, it means that it understands something beyond replicating what's in the data. It should understand something about how to combine cats with phones and astounding crypto losses, which probably means being not particularly happy. And here's what it comes up with. Then here's another one of my favorites, a Victorian man struggles with his addiction to TikTok. Same gist, it's, it's some humor to it. There's also this notion that it's not gonna be in the data. Victorian men did not have access to TikTok. That was 200 years in England. Um, nobody had well anything like TikTok at the time. And here's what it comes up with. It actually gets it really well. It's the the guy's holding an alcohol flask that is some kind of addiction, generally speaking. Red cheeks, looking pretty sad, looking at his phone, and it's all set in the Victorian era. Here's another one of my favorites: Darth Vader realizing he's forgotten to add an attachment to the email. <laughs> Darth Vader never forgot to add attachments, but. We could imagine what it would look like, and again, the model is capable <laughs> of doing this. Looks like a business traveler sitting on the hotel room bed, firing off some emails before going to dinner, and then uh, making a mistake. These were all open eyes Dali model. Um, here's, oh, the prompt should have come first, but um, this one from Google's Imagine, a photo of a Shiba Uno dog with a backpack riding a bike, is wearing sunglasses and a beach hat, and it creates a photorealistic image in this case. A lot of them have come since, so OpenAI's DALI and Google's Imagine came out first. Soon thereafter, Stable Diffusion came out. Um, Stability AI has been hosting that. Midjourney has been building off of that on their Discord servers. Um, in fact, the folks on the Imagine team, one of the key people on the Imagine team is Jonathan Ho, who is a PhD student here, wrote a Diffusion Models paper then went to Google, did this work as well as the Imagine video work, um, and actually left Google to start a company called Ideogram um, because Google was not putting its models out there. It just became frustrating for him to do this great work. And then everybody's like, oh, Dali is so much fun. Midjourney is so much fun. He's like, I built this amazing Imagine model and nobody's having fun with it. Uh, it's just like behind closed doors at Google. And so he started Ideogram, which is also one of the top providers of text to image right now. So in the uh, remainder of today's lecture, we'll look at a few more um, pretty exciting kind of examples of progress in unsupervised learning over the last few years. Kevin will be presenting those. And then at the very end, I'll wrap up the class with the last slide. Um, 
One quick thing that came up during the break, um, it turns out that the forum we use is, um, you can't self-sign up, we have to add you, it seems. Um, and so you're, if you wanna get access to us, you kinda need to start here. If you're already on the class roster, already on the wait list, you should already be on the ed forum. But if you're not, email us here, we can add you to the forum. And then from there, you can start finding everything else because you can find the class website and everything else will post there, um, but yeah. If you're stuck getting started, the whole process, email us here, and then uh, we'll help you get going. Okay, cool. Yeah, so for the remainder of the lecture, we're just going to kind of go over some fun things that unsupervised learning can do today. So a lot of what we looked in the past here and in the last few slides are, are image-based. And, and here's kind of one thing where we try to go into a different domain. So WaveNet here uh, from 2018, it kind of asked the question, okay, we can generate images. Um, what can we do with, with other domains? And it turns out, okay, we can actually generate audio signals as well. And, and the method they use here is actually pretty simple to what we were doing back in the pixel domain. So these are diffusion models, so they're kind of from a bit later. But this WaveNet builds off uh, pixel CNN, which we might cover in the, in the autoaggressive part. Uh, but it basically just predicts the audio uh, step by step. So if you take the raw audio format, predict the next one condition on everything in the past, uh, you get kind of a, a generative model of the entire audio framework. And so WaveNet proves that, OK, if we do this in the right scalable way, this works. Uh, and of course, these things are getting better over time. So this is AudioCraft, um, comes out of Meta uh, from 2023, so just earlier uh, this year or last year. And uh, it's basically building off the same technique. So if we do autoregressive prediction, we can generate the samples one by one. And here, um, we, we use a few tricks. So instead of predicting things in the raw audio space like we're doing back here in WaveNet, uh, in AudioCraft, we first, um, first we'll tokenize everything. So this is kind of a trick that we'll kind of see recurring is that actually if you tokenize things first, uh, predicting is a lot easier. So tokenize everything first. Here we tokenize, for example, text and audio into the same space. Uh, and then you can just concatenate. So text, audio comes after, predict it all at once, uh, and you get basically audio generation. And here they show, OK, we can do it for music, we can generate songs, uh, and we can do it for things such as uh, other sounds. Uh, Text-to-speech is also something we can do with unsupervised learning. So uh, I guess in this case, it is, it is somewhat supervised, as in there are some, some labels we use to connect the two. Uh, but a lot of what's going on here, such as the embeddings and all these things, are, are going on um, in an unsupervised way. So this Takochan work is basically one of, the, one of the landmark works that says, OK, we can take in text, do some processing on it, and we get out these, these spectrograms, which are basically just ways of representing audio. Uh, and then we'll use this, this WaveNet model, so something built off WaveNet earlier, to turn it into, into a raw audio file. Uh, and yeah, these days, the Texas feature has gotten really good. So there's this um, company called Eleven Labs that's been making, uh, basically making these better internally. Uh, we can do things like giving speech in, in different styles. So we have different, for example, personalities here. Uh, and it turns out that converting between styles is also pretty easy. So it's kind of a it's a tough problem to go from text directly to sounds because actually the text doesn't contain all the information you need to make a sound. We we have things like like our intonation, we have expressivity that's that's not exactly all in the sounds. Uh, but if we do, for example, voice conversions, uh, we can convert from like one side to another. So this is something fun that like some of you might have seen in the past. So like it, it gained popularity last year, but basically people using these generators to uh, in, to talk in the voices of, of other people. So one of the famous ones is these presidents talking about something uh, that they would never actually talk about. But it is pretty funny. So that's kind of text-to-speech. And then video is also kind of this new domain. So I think video stuff is, is just starting to work. Um, I know Wilson is working on it. Some people are working on it. Um, but basically, can we, do, can we do generation in video space the same way that generation in, in image, image space is working really well? So here are some examples using GANs. So you know, if we just have data sets of videos, we can actually just predict, or we, we can optimize the, the generative model over that using the same GAN format that we use um, back in images. Uh, and then there's also kind of more methods based on diffusion models. So this, this emu video uh, it does this kind of step-by-step -step process. So what it does is, uh, this is actually text, text to video. The text is not shown, but you can kind of describe the scene first. And then what it does is like, Kind of the lesson learned in this paper is you, if you factorize a distribution, it, it works a lot better. So what you do here is, given the text, first predict the first frame. 
And that's kind of the whole image generation problem in itself. And then given the first frame and the text, let's just generate the rest of the keyframes. And then let's generate the in-between frames. And it turns out just factorizing things that way works really well. We can get things that are at least consistent. I think consistency in the videos is something that's still kind of a, an unsolved problem. I think we're, it's getting there. Things are getting more consistent um, as new works come out. But you can, still, you can still see artifacts here where like this frame doesn't actually connect to, to the other frame physically. Uh, video poet, so this is another kind of concurrent-ish work uh, where they try to do the same problem, so from text to video. Uh, and in video poet, they, they take the same lesson that happened back in the, um, the audio generation where they say, OK, actually, let's just tokenize everything. So the same way that we do it in language models, we're going to tokenize images into image tokens. Uh, and then we have our text tokens, we have our image tokens, we can predict it autoregressively. Uh, and if you scale this like, the right way, we start to get video generation, if that makes sense. So, and I think these are pretty interesting because they see the same sort of scaling properties that we saw back in images. So like these videos obviously are, are not real, like the pandas playing cards. This is not actually in the data distribution, uh, but we have the nice kind of interpolation that, that we proved earlier in, in image space. Now are, they're applying to other domains. And in image uh, and sounds as well, we're able to generate, for example, like uh, songs that are played, you know, modern songs played with a classical instrument, for example, which aren't actually in the data set, uh, but we can guess what they might sound. And, and there's kind of some, some applications for these things outside of just generating videos. Like th these videos here are cool, but it's kind of hard to think of, you know, what, what are we actually going to use it for? Well, one answer is if we can simulate the world, this actually gives us a nice thing if we want to do control. So if we want to, like, for example, uh, get a robot to, to plan, to imagine what would happen if I tried to do a certain thing, well, if we have a good video simulation of the world, we can actually just roll that out. We don't have to run the experiment in real life, but we can run it in a simulation. So as, um, as these models get better and better, we're going to start seeing more downstream applications of them. So the video thing is trained you know, in an unsupervised way. This is kind of the, the pre-training, where the pre-training goes into the world model. Uh, and then later, we can do, for example, reinforcement learning or planning uh, on top of those models. Uh, and then there's a the text link. So we'll, we'll go into this. I won't go into it in too much, because I think the language modeling, we're going to have a lecture on it later. Uh, and I don't want to get too much into language model specific stuff. but. Language models are a form of unsupervised learning. And this is kind of character RNN. Um, Andre Carpathy uh, wrote this little blog post back in 2015 where, where he said, OK, what if we have an RNN, um, a recurrent network, that just predicts each character after another? And this is before um, you know, we, we kind of knew that these things would scale very well. But we could still generate pretty fun things. So some stories, for example, that, that, are, that are made up here. Um, and the, the character level RNNs were actually pretty powerful in that you could train them on things that are not entirely language, uh, natural language. For example, we can generate LaTeX text. We can generate text. Uh, and, and this is a lesson that we'll see in, in language modeling, or at least um, that some people like to say, that language contains a lot more than just words. It, it contains kind of some, some patterns of thought. There, there's arguments that language models can, can serve as foundation models for things that are not just language. Uh, and here is kind of just some very early results that, OK, we can generate math. We can generate things. Uh, I don't know if this math actually makes sense. It, it might be making it up, but it, it, it looks right from a distance. Uh, and then, so yeah, GPT-2, kind of the OpenAI's next attempt at, at scaling these models up, showed that uh, these prompts. So, so I think the main, the main kind of innovation that came out of GPT-2 is that with the right prompting, you can actually get these foundation models, or these like large unsupervised models, to do the things you want them to do. Whereas you know, in the early kind of generate math or generate text, we, we didn't really know how to guide them. It can generate from the distribution of text it's trained on, but we don't know how to get it to do exactly what we want. Uh, and GPT-2 kind of showed that you can just tell it what to do. And it's kind of this, this is the theme we'll see a little bit later is that there's kind of a shift from having to train early on these like supervised models that everything is trained specifically on what we want it, a person, OK, we can just train these, these giant distributions. Um, and as long as we constrain it by providing some, some constraints at the top, like the prompt, what comes after kind of naturally has to follow certain instructions. So GPT-2 is able to do some nice things, uh, like generate stories. And um, it, it can fight against you. I think this is saying, <laughs> yeah, recycling is not good for the world. Don't really want to be saying this, but it can. Uh, and then so 
this is ChatGPT. So GPT-2, this was around in 2019. Since then, the models have scaled up um, even larger, although the, same, the principles are essentially the same. Uh, but we, we can kind of see why it's so powerful to, to learn these unsupervised models, because the same kind of lesson we got here, where we can do a little bit of prompting uh, to get what we want out, uh, continues to improve the better our, our, our distribution matches. So with language models today, you can actually do things like, for example, ask it for JSON output, and it can give you nice structured files. And this is kind of opening up a lot of avenues for like, okay, we can use this to generate things that are readable by computers, not necessarily only by humans. Uh, another kind of nice thing that language models can do today is, is this long form summarization. So as um, the context lengths go up, so as, as the length of text that the models can actually uh, handle in memory goes up, uh, we can start to do kind of more understanding-based tasks. So back in GPT-2, the prompts are usually like a, a sentence long, and then most of the output comes from here. And that's essentially because the limit of the model was, was pretty small. Like You couldn't really go much longer than this. Uh, but now it's cut off over there, but there's a big article about, for example, what unsupervised learning is. Uh, and the models can actually just synthesize it. So we're, we're, we're entering a stage where the, the models themselves can be conditioned in these very like, high, high bit ways, uh, even if the output itself is this low bit. Uh, and yeah, these models uh, are all available for use, so you can try it. I'm sure many of you have heard, heard of these, these things before. Uh, they've been all over around, but uh, yeah, things, things are escaping and, and they're working. So yeah, a little bit about compression as well. So this is paper from, I think, 2017, if this is the same. Um, but, but basically, it's, it's showing how, how generative models can be used as compression. And again, we'll have a lecture on this later. But the basic idea is, if we look at actual kind of hand, handwritten compression methods like JPEG, they, they assume some form about the, the natural image space. So JPEG assumes that pixels are naturally smooth. Uh, and if you assume this, we can Turn pixel, we can turn images into less less bits than if we assume nothing. And compression using a generative model, it's basically doing the same thing, but instead of assuming this kind of natural image distribution in terms of, let's say, smoothness or in terms of neighbors, we just learn it from data. And so we say, OK, if, if all we care about are images that come from, let's say, the, the million images in, in this training set, uh, I only need you know a smaller number of bits because I, I'm assuming, OK, I won't have images of, of noise or of of graphics if it's a 3D data set. Uh, and so we can get compression numbers that are better because we make stricter assumptions. And kind of one, yeah, one, one argument against these models is some of them are, are lossy. I mean, JPEG is already lossy to begin with. And for a lot of applications, it's perfectly fine if it's lossy. Like all video codecs are essentially lossy because it doesn't make sense to encode all of that. Most frames are the same. We can get. If, if your YouTube video doesn't load, you'll see things like this. Um, but if we assume like an even stricter um, constraint on the distribution, we can get things a lot like this, where the same number of bits gives you a much crisper image, because we kind of learned what, what images are likely and which ones aren't. Um, things in 3D are also working. So this is a paper from 2020 that uses uh, NERFs. So NERFs are this, this way of representing a 3D image as kind of implicitly as the output of a, a neural network. Uh, and the first NERF paper is just train them um, by taking videos essentially of one object. And then this paper, which is, I think it's like, it's either a GAN-based NERF or a, or a VAE-based NERF. But it says, OK, actually, if we have a, a representation of a 3D model, um, let's just learn that distribution. Let's learn to generate things. Uh, and so we, here we have models of basically like, like a car, a chair. And because these models are actually 3D models, you can move the camera around and see them from different angles. And again, a lot of the, the power of these methods comes from the fact that they are unsupervised. You don't need labels. We don't actually even need the, the 3D models themselves in some cases. As long as you have pictures of them, it's enough to reconstruct the, the model itself. Is there any question about the JPEG compression stuff? Yeah. Is the generative model how you can take this natural to space? Like, is there a hypercharacteristic of like being rich in hypothetical blocks or like how to do it? Yeah, it's a great question, and I don't know the answer off my head. Uh, I, I could make a guess, but I think you would you would get the correct answer reading the work here. I can Unless, jump in for yeah. a moment. So for some generative models, it's a bit harder to measure. But for the ones that optimize likelihood, it's literally the likelihood. So the law, average log loss directly translates into bits. Now, you might have to apply a factor log 2 to it to get it in bits rather than in nats. 
um, but it's the same metric. Um, just because in optimal compression, assuming you use optimal compression, you get to compress your data down to the entropy of the distribution. That's the number of bits you need. And that corresponds to the average log prop of all your data points. Entropy is average log prop, and so your lo average log prop is exactly what's being measured there. It's measured in, and so bits per byte here means average log prop per byte. A, an image will have a red byte, a green byte, and a blue byte to represent the three colors at each location. And so it's measuring what is the average log prop per image and then normalizing it by the number of bytes that are in the image to get you this number. Uh, yeah, so basically that's that's one application of these models, do some compression. And, and like Peter said earlier, if you actually look at the, the how to measure the compression, it, it requires an optimal encoder and an optimal decoder. So that kind of motivates the fact that the more powerful your model is, the better you should be able to actually reach this bound on the, how, how you can compress the data. Yeah, and the optimal, since the optimal compressor is not actually possible, don't they usually use the normalized compression system, which comes from the Kolmogorov complexity? Right, so I guess, yeah, one way you could view these, these are all lower bounds. Like, we don't know the, the true compression of the data set because we don't know if our encoder or decoder are optimal. Um, I guess you can say that they're like optimal-ish in, in terms of if, you're, if your Kolmogorov complexity is how many parameters your, your network is. This is, it's not the best actually you can get in that parameter count because we're training and there could be a better solution in that parameter space, but it's, it's what we get if we try to push as hard as we can on those bounds. Uh, yeah, so 3D generation, it's also getting better. So th this is from 2020. This is what we can do in, in 2022 now. Again, similar similar techniques uh, where we kind of assume. And, and the interesting thing about 3D is we can actually assume even more. It, it's kind of even more unsupervised than, than 2D images. Because in 2D images, we, we have data sets of 2D images. Uh, in 3D, sometimes we don't even have data sets of 3D models. All we have are our 2D pictures of the world. Uh, but we can assume certain things about them. Like if you take kind of a few pictures of, a, of an object from different perspectives, we know that light reflects in certain ways. And, and there's kind of one model that actually results in these views. And by writing down little things like this, uh, we can actually generate models even though we don't have that data. So it's kind of, we have one assumption and then we can do our, our unsupervised stuff uh, under this assumption. Uh, and finally, like there, there's some domains that are also less visual, but arguably more, more important, AlphaFold as one of them, um, figured out how to do essentially protein prediction. Uh, and here there is, I think there is some supervision at the end, but a, a, a lot of the power comes from this kind of unsupervised uh, representation learning that happens in the protein space um, before this. Um, yeah, and so, so maybe, what came before that was, okay, here, here are some cool applications of what we can do with unsupervised learning. Um, and, and now it's like a bit of motivation for why unsupervised learning is important. Um, if you, even if you have a specific problem you want to solve, uh, sometimes it's better to still do large-scale pre-training before. Uh, and, and this is from the Foundation Models paper uh, from Stanford. But a lot of the field these days is moving to this, this setting where we do this large-scale unsupervised pre-training, uh, and then we do adaptation to what we actually care about. And the form of adaptation can take many forms. It can be fine-tuning the network. It can be prompting. It could even be, for example, zero shot or, or some, something few shot. But this sort of paradigm has, has kind of, this is a big shift from maybe 10 years ago, five years ago. Um, this is now kind of what, what uh, seems to be working, at least in terms of generalizing to some real problems. And so we'll, we'll show some examples of, of how this pre-trained formulation ha has come out. So this is from the GPT paper, I believe. And it shows that, okay, we have these language models. We can actually, they just do sentiment detection. Um, I think this is either with a linear header or some sort of small adaptation. Uh, it knows how to do sentiment detection off the bat. And uh, a lot of things now build off these things where, we, okay, we, for example, pre-train with, with a BERT loss or we'll see later a GPT loss. Uh, and then they, they solve these benchmarks at a much higher rate. 
So we'll see, for example, the way we actually measure it, and this is in language model space, how good a language model is, is actually pretty, it's pretty intricate. There's all these different kinds of things like, like code generation, reading comprehension, maybe solving exams. And it's really showing the point that the unsupervised learning on these models can then solve like all these random domains that it's not actually like, specifically trained to be able to do. Uh, and, and there's this, so prompting is kind of a, we won't go too much into it, but it's, it's also this, this adaptation method where there's a lot of interesting things like strategies now about how to actually extract what we want uh, out of the big models. So we, we know that these models have all these this knowledge ingested. We know that at some level they, they've represented them correctly or represented them to a really nice degree. And then the question is just how to get it out. And there's some there's some messy ones. Um, this is from OpenAI's guide, and, and the fact that they have the guide on there shows that this is something that people are at least thinking a lot about. And finally, we'll, we'll see the same thing in vision. So this is this is from kind of this is from 2018, but this is this is using contrastive learning, so uh, an, another unsupervised method, uh, and it's showing that the performance when we transfer from unlabeled data, even on these tasks that have traditionally been been using supervised data, uh, they're still pretty good. And uh, for example, masked autoencoders, which comes out in 2021, also shows results on on these data sets, which are traditionally um, you can train a supervised method on it. It turns out if you pre-train this, this big uh, autoencoder on a lot of data, uh, it works better. Uh, and okay, so this is the last slide, and it, it's just an overview of all the stuff before. But I think one one kind of nice motivating thing about about unsupervised learning is it seems like the method that scales the best as as data comes in. Like we saw the Lacoon's cape earlier, where where most of the volume is is. Uh, on supervised learning, and that's because it's just so much easier to collect through this raw data than to have human labels. And human labels, they can be wrong, they can be, they can be multimodal, they can have all sorts of weird properties. Um, whereas the fact that essentially the same methods, such as like autoregressiveness or or things we'll learn later in the class, can solve all these different domains should should tell something about um, that there's something correct about how we're doing this. Thank you, Gavin. Um, I want to quickly highlight one thing that uh, we went over just a little fast. This slide here, this is from 2020, and I want to highlight the thing on the right here. There was a bet between two professors here, Alyosha Efros and Jatendra Malik. And it, the formal version of the bet says, if by the first day of autumn of 2015, a method will exist that can match or beat the performance of RCNN, on Pascal VOC detection, so detection task rather than classification, without use of any extra human annotations, uh, so unsupervised pre-training effectively, Mr. Malik promises to buy Mr. Efros one gelato, two scoops, one chocolate, one vanilla. So what was going on here? Alyosha Efros challenged the tender and said, I think unsupervised learning will win. And Jatenna said, well, let's make a bet around it. You tell me when it's going to win. Clearly, Alyosha was optimistic. He put it on autumn 2015. It didn't happen until this paper here, the CPC V2 paper, which was autumn 2020. Um, so um, yeah, uh, five, year, five years later. But it did happen. And I think it's kind of interesting to see some of these things play out where uh, for the longest time, the thing that was winning, there were actually other things people were already thinking about that you could project into the future would be the ones winning out in the long run. We're just not there yet. We need to figure out some details. We need to figure out scale. And once it's figured out, it'll actually uh, be better than what is the current way of doing things. So Chitendra got the gelato from Alyosha in this case. But um, in the long run, Alyosha was, was right, I guess, that unsupervised learning is a more powerful pre-trainer. So in summary, unsupervised learning is actually rapidly advancing as a field thanks to compute, for sure, deep learning engineering practice becoming better, data sets, and these days lots of people working on it. It's not just an academic interest topic anymore. It used to be, but definitely not anymore today. Language modeling, image generation, vision language, multimodal pre-training are all working really well and have production level impact with the BERT one 
for Google search haven't been the first one, but obviously many more now. What is true now may not be true even a year from now. And I'll give you two examples just to make this concrete. Um, example one, we just talked about self-supervised pre-training was way worse than supervising computer vision tasks like detection segmentation until actually so it turns out it was fall 2019 when CPC v2 came out and now it's better. Example two, representational for vision through masking didn't work. People said why not just mask like in, in language you just mask things out. Nothing worked um, or nothing worked all that well until Kai Ming He and his collaborators um, made it work in November 2021. And the word on the street was masking doesn't work in vision. It doesn't work. But turns out now it's what works the best. So these things are all in flux and that's one of the things I wanted to keep in mind. I, I would love to see final projects where you challenge some of the common wisdoms of today and you ideally you have a reason for it, right? Maybe the reason here could have been, well, if it works for language, why can it not at least work reasonably well for vision? Maybe it's not going to be the best, but at least it should be reasonably well. What was the key thing Kai Ming did that nobody else did? Well, first, he's a very good experimenter, so he iterated over many things. He's, he's the best. But then what ultimately mattered is he masked out 80 90% of the image. And it turns out that it was key. And before that, people were masking out 10 20%. And masking out 10 20%, the task turns out too easy. Remember the early slide, Jeff in the saying the brain must be doing a lot of work with having you know 10 to the 5 synapses available per second to be trained. Um, well, Kai Ming effectively said, let's put the neural network, make it work harder than just refilling back in 10, 20%, make it somehow create the 90% that you left out, and all of a sudden, results are great. Um, the vision transformer architecture helps with making masking easier to do in your training. And hence, it also helped in kind of making this possible. Um, but a combination of factors, I think the biggest one, ultimately, conceptually, is masking way more than anybody had ever done before. Um, Autoregressive models, flows, VAEs, GANs, diffusion models, um, the ones we'll cover in the first five weeks of class, I think they still have significant room for surprising capabilities, meaning that maybe if you scale it up in a domain where people haven't done it yet, um, Maybe video, which is still a very early domain for people to apply this to. Maybe robotics, which is still early going. Bio data, other sciences data. Even just applying the current ideas can likely give very surprising uh, results. So it's a great time to work with them on them. Um, but I also think the core of unsurprised learning might still have some major innovations ahead. Um, the example I gave earlier, last offering in 2020, which is a while ago now, but back then we had no lecture on diffusion models because we hadn't written the denoising diffusion probabilistic models paper yet. And at the time people thought of GANs as the thing that is the best at image generation. And since then it's obviously changed. I think more changes could be ahead. And so I really challenge you to think hard about all these methods that we'll be presenting and um, see if you can somehow find a way to to improve them by thinking very hard about what, how they sit up. And I think often, and of course, I'll try to give more color when we're getting to specific ones, but often the devil's in the details in these things. Something is presented, the big picture makes sense. It seems like, yeah, this is gonna be the best, and maybe it's even the best as it's presented. But then you go to the specifics of how it's actually written out in the equations, and actually there's already a bit of a gap from the motivation to what the equations actually have. And then maybe the implementation introduces another gap because exactly the math is not what's being implemented. And so there's all these gaps that could come along the way where you could see an opportunity to make things better and maybe invent the next generation or next iteration of these, of these models. And that would be a pretty great outcome if that could happen uh, from this class. All right, that's it for today. Thank you and uh, see you all next week.